all of us uh, agreed that this was a um, very timely uh, discussion uh, given all of the recent literature and the fact that diabetes mellitus is so commonly seen in uh, the small animal practice setting. Certainly clinicians are uh, suspicious of diabetes as a differential in any patient that presents with polyuria, polydipsia, perhaps polyphagia, and weight loss. Clinical pathology findings in these patients are fairly consistent in that uh, they have a hyperglycemia uh, that is often persistent, uh, accompanied by uh, glucose in the urine. Of course, diabetic ketoacidosis is a severe complication of diabetes mellitus, not only in cats but also in dogs, uh, characterized by a metabolic acidosis, as well as um, an accumulation of ketones in either the blood or the urine. Um, although previous retrospective studies have tried to define risk factors and outcome predictors for DKA in cats, uh, these previous studies have had small patient populations, which makes uh, this paper um, all the more relevant uh, given the fact that they looked at 93 cases um, in cats. So we turn our uh, attention to cats tonight. Um, in this study, uh, the investigators looked at uh, a wide variety of data collected from these 93 cats, including the signalment, um, concurrent diseases that these cats had, uh, a very wide array of clinical pathology that was studied, as well as the treatments that these cats uh, received. And all of this data was examined for any association with uh, the outcome. Uh, for these particular patients. And in terms of the outcome, uh, there were two possibilities. One was a poor outcome, which meant that the patient died either due to natural causes or due to euthanasia. And a good outcome indicated that they lived to discharge. With that, I'm now pleased uh, to pass controls of this uh, space to Dr. Melissa Holohan, who's going to talk to us more about DKA in cats. Um, Dr. Holohan, um, the floor is now yours, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Berger. So the summary of the main findings of this study were that there was an increased risk for cats with diabetes mellitus in both males and Abyssinians. Cats that were more likely to have um, the presence of DKA were those that were young cats, cats again that were Abyssinian or Siamese breeds, and then those cats that were either a normal body weight or underweight. And this study also found that there was approximately an 18% chance of reoccurring episodes in DKA, which I think is always an important thing for us to talk to our clients about when we're approaching these patients, because a lot of them are presenting in DKA for the first time, and the owners are just now realizing that the cats have diabetes and what's kind of to come from there and what their commitment is. So when they looked at DKA outcome, there was a 39% poor outcome, and the cats with a poor outcome were more likely to have an increased B1 and creatinine, an increased bilirubin, and an increased magnesium. And in particular, this study went on to look at several cats that were necropsy, and of those cats, the postmortem findings supported 100% of those cats had renal lesions and 100% had pancreatic lesions. And I think this is something we see very commonly clinically. And many times it can be a combination of both pre-renal dehydration and patients that may be hypovolemic at presentation causing that azotemia, as well as I think there's some new evidence and um, more supporting evidence for patients that are presenting with acute kidney injury as part of the component of not only DKA, um, but potentially potentially the secondary pancreatitis that these patients may have. And we certainly know as clinicians, clinically, patients with DKA may very well have concurrent pancreatitis as one of their common um, presenting diseases. And so those um, diseases go hand in hand, hand in hand. And in people, they've actually shown that patients with pancreatitis can get a secondary acute kidney injury. And so those may all be related and certainly one of the reasons that may have been associated with a poor outcome. 
medical interventions for this study, of course, were IV fluids across the board, um, and plus or minus various supplementation. So that would include potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, and in a few cases, sodium bicarb. I think in our hospital, our experience with DK patients is all of them go on potassium to start, and depending on the severity of the patient um, at presentation, they may go on anywhere from 30 milliequivalents up. I think in general, the more majority of us start at a minimum of 30 milliequivalents per liter because inevitably those patients typically will have a drop in potassium, and sometimes it's very hard to get their potassium back up um, rather than being proactive about it. Um, same thing with phosphorus and magnesium. That's typically going to be seen with our more severely affected DKA cats. Um, however, we definitely are monitoring those cats very closely for those uh, electrolyte duration. So the medical interventions for this study in particular were looking at two different insulin CRI protocols. The majority of these patients, because it was a retrospective, um, were in the 1.1 unit per kg per 240 ml category. It's important to note that these patients that were in the lower insulin CRI category, 30% of them actually needed to have an increase in their insulin additives to the fluids. And then the other category was a patient group of cats that had 2.2 units per kg per 240 ml, and that was approximately 70% of the patient study population. And then these cats had their insulin CRIs adjusted um, they were at a 10 mil per hour rate, and every two hours the rate was adjusted based on the blood glucose that was being um, taken at that time. The findings of this study showed that improved outcomes in DKA cats were found in those that were treated with the higher initial dose of insulin concentration, and that potentially the 2.2 unit per kg initially may be preferred over 1.1 unit per kg per the 240 mils of saline. And I think when we look back at other studies of um, other species, in particular people and dogs, this is very similar to the initial standard of care um, in people and dogs with DKA. So the outcome for those um, with a good outcome had a median hospitalization of six and a half days, and the time to sub-Q insulin was approximately 82 hours. And I think this is pretty similar to the um, average patients, but again, remember this is a university, um, and so some of these cats are going to be the more severely affected patient population um, because they were referred to a tertiary hospital for care. So many of the DKA cats that are presenting to the hospital may not be as severely affected, and I think the average at our hospital is probably somewhere around four to five days of hospitalization and about two and a half um, days to sub-Q insulin. So I think everywhere is different just depending on what patient population you're seeing. Other findings in this study showed that the electrolyte and pH imbalances worsened during hospitalization, and in particular, the study noted that frequent reassessments within the first 35 hours of treatment is warranted. And this is definitely parallel with what we do at our hospital um, in our ICU for DKA, especially the electrolytes, and we add on a phosphorus because it's not standard in our electrolyte pro um, profile. We will do electrolytes and a phosphorus every 12 hours for the first 24 hours, and then if things are stable, we'll move forward with every 24 hours thereafter. Um, but definitely early on, as you're having those big shifts in the glucose changes, um, with the insulin being added on, you definitely want to take a look at those electrolytes more closely. And in a patient that may be more severely affected or is not responding like you typically would expect, I would encourage you to add on an ionized calcium and, if possible, an ionized magnesium uh, to evaluate those patients further, um, especially those patients where potentially the electrolyte imbalances are not correcting appropriately, even despite aggressive therapy, and or you have a patient that's hypotensive and not responsive to your fluid resuscitation. So DKA test does carry a guarded prognosis, and I think that we have to prepare our clients for this um, on the um, forefront when we're talking to them about hospitalization. And I think 40% does reflect, when you look at a lot of the studies, there are a few other studies that show a better outcome than this current study. Um, but overall, we do need to prepare our clients for um, possible complications with treatment and that it's a, a, a big commitment, both in hospitalization stay, potentially some of those cats, again, having to be in the hospital for a week, as well as long-term commitment. But 
the majority of these cats, just like people, I always remind my clients, can live a, a good quality of life with a, a diabetic cat if, if it's well managed and follow up is um, done appropriately. And I think that as general practitioners, when you have certain breeds coming into the hospital, it may be important up front when they come in as young cats to educate those clients that both Abyssinian and Siamese cats may have genetic factors that are influenced on influencing a higher risk for diabetes as well as DKA.